Good to see you, man. Good to see you, Joe. I'm excited about this new year. Are you? I am. I am. It's, I'm certainly excited to have last year behind us. That's for sure. I am super pumped and excited. I'm anticipating this year coming ahead to be an exciting year. A lot of cool things um, I think are going to be happening. Um, and we're going to talk about on this coaching call here, um, kind of what Matt and I feel like is ahead for 2021, what's going to be working, what worked well, and what's going to be working well in 2021. We're going to talk about that. And then we're also going to be answering your questions and uh, as many as we can. We've got a lot of people on. We had well over a thousand people register on the Zoom and we're pushing this out to Facebook and uh, YouTube live right now, even Periscope and LinkedIn. Hopefully that's working. We'll see. So how are you guys doing? If you're watching this right now on YouTube or Facebook, um, if you want to ask us questions, you need to join us in Zoom. Only the good friends who are in Zoom can type in their questions here in the Zoom chat. We'll do our best to answer all of them. Uh, I hope we can get to all of them. We'll see. Um, so I just got to give you guys a few different um, things here. Number one, uh, we just finished the free screening, a 10-day free screening of the Creative Financing Lab that Matt and I did a little while ago. Gave away everything for free, Matt. I can't believe we did that. I know. Um, well, we were delusional during Christmas, so. Yeah, we I had a little spirit. too much eggnog to drink. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, um, it was really cool. I mean, this was a case study that we did. Tons of success stories came out of it. And it was really cool. And we just said, hey, you know what? In the spirit of the season, um, let's give away everything that we sold. And we released it in uh, one day chunks. So every day a new module was released and then it was taken down. And the next day the new module was released and was taken down. So we are removed, like you guys now can get it. You can get access to the lifetime recordings, but we're taking them down Sunday night at midnight. Okay. You can buy it after that for $2,100, but we have all of the recordings, all of the resources, plus a re some really cool bonuses available um, up until Sunday night. Tonight's Thursday night. We're taking it down. Sunday night. Okay. Um, so you can get that if you're all interested in getting it, I'm going to give you a link right now and I'll put it in the zoom chat. Um, you can get the recordings and I believe it is, is it just something ridiculous? 397. Is that right, Matt? Let me, if you go to creative financing lab slash 2021 creative financing lab. Yes. Creative financing lab slash 2021. I'm going to put this in the zoom chat for you all. Um, you can get, let me just show my screen. Cause I want to show this. What, what ahead, gonna, I'll be right back. Be right we back. can, um, uh, we'll, we'll walk through everything that we've said, Matt, we lost your video for a second, but that's all right. Um, okay. So do you see my screen guys? Do you see my screen, Matt? Yeah, you probably do. All right. This is the creative financing lab. And I'm just going to show this to you. We're, this we're getting 89% off lifetime access to this. Um, and you're going to get the entire course that we did all of the modules, introduction, mindset, owner financing offer, lease option offer, seller marketing one and two, buyer marketing one and two, automation, delegation, raising private money, which was awesome. Matt just spilled the beans and shared everything you need to know how to raise all the private money you could ever need. My module pleasure. 10. Okay. And you're going to get, you can get the physical copy, by the way, if you don't sign up by Sunday night, we're taking down, you can't get any more physical copies of it. We're not going to keep on offering that. Even if you paid the $2,100, you can't get the physical copies of anything, but you're going to get the, um, uh, the 10 training modules, the transcripts of everything, the guidebook, which includes all of our checklists and contracts and calculators and postcards and a Rolodex and everything, all the MP3s. Plus we're going to be doing six more live Q and a calls for only people in the program. We have an online student group where you can share your successes and wins and challenges. We have two extra bonus marketing classes that we're including we have another, uh, we have one of mine, uh, some live marketing, went into a market and did some live marketing. And Matt has a course called Lead Machine Masterclass you get access to. You get access to our previous recorded calls and you get all of our books, okay? Crazy, crazy awesome value and you can get it all. Digital only for $297 or physical and digital for $397 if you like to read or if you like, you know, DVDs and USB memory th thumb drives. Um, you can get it right now. Okay. So if you're interested in that, go to creative financing lab.com slash 2021. I mean, we have so many testimonials. It's crazy. Last time we did this, we gave a ton of people their money back. 
when they completed the challenge, um, which was amazing. So again, creativefinancinglab.com slash 2021. Okay, cool. And we'll talk more about that in a minute, but that is going to be your opportunity. We're taking that down Sunday night. You can pay the $2,100 after Sunday night. Um, okay, one more announcement. One more announcement. I've seen some of the chat here. People are saying, hey, I missed some of the 10 days or- hey, If you put that link in there, did you have it set to panelist there? Oh, you had it. I did uh, attendees and panelists. You got it. Okay, cool. Do you guys see it? You want me to do it I again? I saw some comments, so I wasn't sure, but I had skipped out for a sec, so my bad. Well, let me, I'll just put it in there one oh, more there. time in case people are joining in late. All right, go ahead. Boom, there it is. There it is. All right, good. We're getting the questions already. Um, so we'll get through that. Some of you have missed some of the 10 days. That's why we're making this available. Creativefinancinglab.com slash 2021. Okay, one more announcement. Um, we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so um, I thought, good, Matt, it would be a good idea if before we start answering questions, mm -hmm. um, if we talk a little bit about what we are projecting to happen in 2021. Mm -hmm. What do you see as working in 2021? And I'll share a few things here first, and then you can share if you want, or do you want to go first? It doesn't matter. I'm ready. So okay. you're, you're talking ahead, about now. with regard to like I, investing. Well, go ahead, because I've been talking too much already, and people would rather hear from you, I'm okay. sure. That's probably true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the uh, you're talking about the, what we're going to do, investing strategy, or are we talking about? Yeah, like, you know, marketing that's going to be working in 2021, the strategies that are going to be working. What are you seeing? Yeah, no, I, I see a lot of the same. I think 2020 really surprised us. I th you know, back in March and April, we were all predicting this big crash and it never came. And I've been speaking a lot about this, um, sharing all of this on my YouTube channel with graphs and pictures and diagrams. So if you'd like, go to epicrei.tv. I just put one up today, talking about it again on what, what I'm thinking about the future. And I'm trying to take as much of my opinion out of it and just use really just data and statistics. And um, the uh, I don't see the market crashing at all, not in 2021. I looked at the, uh, if you look at the forbearance chart of all the, the delinquent mortgages, there's a lot of them, right? There's a lot of people not paying it. But if you, you kind of follow the, 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 it's on a general downward trend and as you're watching it, it, you can see like those trends and little bumps and spikes and everything are almost in perfect unison with, uh, um, with lockdowns and unemployment. So once we get through this virus, and we will, um, we're not going to see the forbearances that, we've, that we see right now. It's going to drop drastically. And, and there'll still be some people left over, but most of those uh, delinquencies are going to go away. And if you look at the unemployment rate, yeah, but what about the people who don't have the jobs? Well, we're at 6.7% unemployment. I haven't seen the ones for December yet, but for November it was 6.7%. And if you go back in history, the last time we were at 6.7% was with, during the Obama administration, March of 2014. And if you look at the GDP was on its way up. And if you look at the Case-Shiller housing index, that was on its way up. So at an unemployment rate of 6.7%, we have history of the economy actually booming during those times. So I don't see the unemployment hitting there. I don't see the uh, forbearance impacting it. What was the other thing I was thinking about? There's something else. But what I do see, and this is where the ground will replay in. So everything I'm talking about is kind of impacts the retail market. It, 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 um, it addresses on-market deals. But as is real estate investors, we work off-market. So we have to always keep in mind, like it, you can be a little bit, uh, get sidetracked if you're watching too much like mainstream media or reading mainstream resources that are talking about the real estate market and how the houses are booming and there's a hundred people lined up to, to bid an offer on a house and all that kind of stuff. But that's all retail. That's on market. That's not where we play. Okay. We play off market and we're looking for the, all the D's, right? We're looking for the disease and the death and the divorce and the delinquency and the distress and all the, I don't know, I got seven other D's that I can't think of them right now, but we're looking for all that kind of stuff that causes people, property owners specifically, to turn to their houses, their properties for financial relief. They got something bigger going on in their life than trying to get full price for their dollar and having to wait out the market for it. So that's where we play. That's where we market to. And we know during this pandemic and during this last year, there's a lot of those D's are impacting people in a big way right now. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of, a lot more distress situations coming available to us but we just might not see them unless we're marketing and putting our messages in the right places. Yeah. 
I would say the same thing, similar, maybe a different angle. I, I, I see the housing market continuing its tear in a good, you know, the hot streak in 2021. You know, the big problem is inventory. Where there's just not enough inventory. So if you have a house that you want to sell, this is the best time to do it. Yes. I would still encourage people to be very, very careful with the high-end luxury rehabs. You still got to be very careful because that could, this could change, you know, what's going to happen as the, you know, all of this money that the government is putting into the economy, somebody has to pay for that. And it's going to come down the road or maybe we're just kicking the can, but I think it is coming down the road, high in inflation. We're going to see the, the housing market take a hit, I believe in the next couple, three, four years. Cycles, they go up and down. They can't just continue going high like it is forever. <clears throat> Having said that, at least for the next year, I see inventory still staying really, really tight. Um, it's going to be very easy to sell your deals. Now, having said that, sometimes it freaks people out. Like, oh my gosh, like the market's white hot. People, all they need to do is stick a sign in the yard and they can sell their house like that with multiple offers. Well, yeah, that's true. But I'm telling you guys, even that's been true for the last five to seven years. And we're still finding deals. We're still finding deals. We're still buying deals in the last month in the last six months and last year at huge discounts. So they're, the deals are still out there. They just may be a little harder to find than they were back at the height of the recession in 08 and 09 when there were deals everywhere. But that doesn't mean they're not there. And in fact, it kind of adjusts too. You know, like maybe it's harder to find deals a little bit, but it's also a lot easier to sell deals. So you can actually still make a lot of money on your deals, whether you're doing cash deals or creative financing deals. The final thing I'll say, I think this is so important to understand. The, the market in 2021, in any market, if you want to succeed, you need to know how to make creative financing offers to your sellers, all right? Because sellers, you know, they may have some motivation, but they don't have enough equity. And, and, and motivation comes in any market, hot or cold or flat. People, sometimes, you know, life happens. They lose their jobs. They get divorced. They have a death in the family. Um, they just have to move a job relocation, a better job opens up and they, you know, move somewhere. They, they still, they can't sell their house for what they thought they could sell it for. And I've seen this over and over again in the last few years. Anytime somebody has come to me and said, oh, my market is too hot. You can't do deals. All you need to do is stick a sign. I say, really? Then I go into their market and I go into Redfin and I look for all of the properties that have been on the market over 90 days. There is a wealth of opportunity right now if you know how to do creative financing deals on the houses that have been on the market over 90 days, you do it yourself. Go to Redfin right now and look in your city and look, there's an option in the filters for time on Redfin and go time on Redfin more than 60 days, more than 90 days. And you'll be blown away. And we've done this before and I've tested this and I've shown the results. You send letters to the owners of those properties that have been on the market over 60, 90 days and you send them an offer and say something like, hey, I can get you your price if you'd be willing to lease it for a year first and then sell it. Or if you'd be willing to take owner financing or something like that. And yes, it's called Time on Redfin. Um, and, and you'll be shocked at the responses you get from that. There's a lot of them out there. So don't let the, the fact that the market is hot scare you because there is still a lot of opportunity. And if you understand creative financing, like we're going to be talking about, and, you know, when you make an offer, instead of getting one out of 30 accepted, you could get three out of 30 accepted, right? And we're seeing this also, I'm telling you, um, I just did a new market challenge. We went into Nebraska and I went into El Paso, Texas, and we're real close to some deals right now. And one of my, one of my best channels of marketing, I did like six or seven different things, was sending blind offers to the older listings and also sending emails to the realtors of these older listings and saying, hey, I, if I can, you know, I can see that this property has been on the market for 90 days. Um, would your client, I'm, this is what I'm sending to realtors, you know, would your client accept something? And if I could get them that price, would they consider seller financing or lease purchase or something like that? I'm just giving you one little strategy. There is still some marketing that can work for you to do more deals in 2021. Um, but you, you got to understand, you got to learn how to do marketing. You need to learn how to talk to sellers. You need to learn how to make simple offers. This isn't complicated. Just make real simple offers and then give the sellers options. That's the one big thing I hope you all can get and take away from this. Make multiple options. Give the seller options. And it doesn't matter to you which one they choose, right? Here, 
cash offer, seller financing, lease option. Give them offers, give them different options and then follow up every 30 days. That is the quote unquote secret. That's it. What do you cool. think? I like it. Yeah. No, you're, you're right. I'm just, I, I, my thing is just always to be careful and separate on market data with off market decisions. Mm, that's, that's, what that's what I'm really kind of focused with. Or I want people yeah. to pay attention to because you can get led astray if the market is going up or if the market is crashing, if you're just watching the TV, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, as you had said, life tends to happen to everybody every single day, mm -hmm. regardless of location, regardless of demographic, you know, life comes along and delivers us uh, some tough lessons. And, you know, yep. we need to fix that type of stuff. And sometimes it's only the finances from our property that, that will do it. Yep. Very so good. Cool. All right. So let's go through the questions. There's a ton coming through. Some people might, might have to, I don't, might have to start typing your stuff in again. Well, I'm going to find one here. And while I'm looking, you can find one then right. to answer. Cool. And uh, I'm going down from the top to the bottom. Okay, I'll go from the bottom to the top and we'll meet in the middle. All right, all right. So if you guys have questions, here we are right now. We're going to answer your questions. Um, if you are a student of Creative Financing Lab, you'll get access to these recordings. And also, if you're a student, don't forget, we have six more of these coaching calls that we're going to be doing for students only. Again, go to uh, creativefinancinglab.com slash 2021, creativefinancinglab.com slash 2021 um, to get access to this, all right? Um, right here we go. I got a YouTube, good one. By the way, for reason. Sorry? This is going to be on YouTube, by the way? Yeah, I've just, this is on YouTube right now. And I, I put in the link for all you guys in Zoom, a link to Matt's channel and a link to my channel. So make sure you subscribe to our channels. I, I do videos two or three times a week. I know Matt does a bunch of really good ones. So subscribe to our YouTubes and get the content uh, as we go. All right, we're ready. I got a question here. Go ahead. Um, Matt, given the current real estate environment, expecting a downturn in pricing in a few months. Well, somebody is, I guess, predicting this. They're expecting a downturn in pricing in a few months. Are you still bullish on seller financing and low equity subject to deals? Um, okay, so first of all, I don't see any, I'm not saying the market's not gonna turn downward. I just don't see anything that's caused it to turn downward in the past. None of that stuff exists at this moment. So that's, that's my one thing. So someone had low interest that. rates, low inventory. Yeah, right? exactly. And a ton of pent up demand, a ton of pent up money. Wait, that's not going to change in the next 12 months. No, I don't think so either. Plus, even if you look at the foreclosure and, and the unemployment, regardless whether you don't have a job or you're not making your payments, properties are appreciating. You got equity. And when you have equity, you have options. Foreclosure isn't the only option when you have equity in your house. So that's why I just, there, there's so many things that are supporting it. And then you got government intervention. And now that Trump's going to be out of office, there's not a chance in hell that the new administration is going to let the market crash in their first year. <laughs> I mean, that would just be, they, after they've talked four years of, of crap about the president, they got to look better than him. So I think there's so many different forces that are going to keep the market propped up at least for 2021. But we're not going to talk about thing, market. We're not going to talk think, about politics. I know, but but that's really important because good, right I know I'm now, just joking. Ordered by stimulus and government programs, so that has yeah. nothing to do with politics. It's just what's so, and it doesn't matter who's in the office. That's happening, right? Yes. So, um, what was the other question? That's why uh, I don't see the market. Oh, down. Are you still bullish on seller financing and low low equity subject to deals? Yes, I'm more bullish on borrowing money, other people's money, whether it's the existing financing or the seller's financing or Aunt Sally's financing. I borrow as much as you can because the other aspect that's going on in it right now, which and someone had talked about a black swan event here, this could be it. I don't know what's happening to the dollar. I don't know what's happening to inflation, but um, when the inflation kind of, it, it decreases the value of your dollar, it decreases the purchasing power of your dollar, right? But it also decreases the value of the debt. So the best place you can be is owning a tangible asset like a real estate that produces an income with debt attached to it. Now, I'm not saying over leverage. I'm not saying doing it irresponsibly because that's going to come up here in a second. Don't do that. But take on debt. Borrow, borrow, borrow. If you got equity in your properties, I'm running a bunch of refis on my properties right now to go out and buy some more. Um, I think that's, that's the smart move right now, but don't over leverage yourself. Don't get in deeper than you can, but borrow as much as you can responsibly. Let me add to that. I did a really good interview on my podcast, real estate investing mastery. You got to subscribe to both of our podcasts, by the way, mine is called real estate investing mastery and Matt's called Epic real estate. 
I think two of the best podcasts in podcasting world. I think. I think okay. so. Anyway, I, Certainly two of the longest running. Yeah, <laughs> and we'll not talk about whose is longer because Matt's Let's beat me by a couple who's months. Longer, Joe. <laughs> a couple, just a couple months. All right, but anyway, um, I just interviewed a good friend of mine, Michael Jake. Michael Jake is an investor in Colorado Springs, a screaming hot market. That market has been hot forever, and he's been on this. He's been doing really, really well, buying low equity, subject to deals, and the and this was a really good interview I did with him just in the last a couple of weeks. You can find it on my podcast. But anyway, one of the things he talked about in that was so good is um, the reason why it works. And when you do it though, let me just tell you, you've got to be under, you got to understand, you got to have the, what would you say? Um, the ability and the knowledge to manage these properties and you've got to have the reserves. Okay. Um, so they, they've got to cash flow. The whole goal of that and the low equity deals is to, keep them for the long-term, all right? And one of the good things that Michael Jake talked about is how he puts long-term tenants in his properties. He wants to keep it to build long-term wealth, not to just flip it in a year or two years to a tenant buyer. Although that's a good strategy, but for him, and I thought this was really good, when you buy a property subject to, your goal is to keep it for 20, 30 years. Pay it down, take the tax benefits on from it, you know? Um, that is cheap debt. And then get a long-term tenant with really stellar credit in there, all right? And he's done a lot of studies with this um, and in his own business and from people that he knows, your costs for maintenance and vacancies will be less by putting in really good high quality tenants in them instead of versus tenant buyers with bad credit, hoping that they buy it. So for a long-term wealth strategy, I love that. Um, so just make sure number one, when the, you you you're cash flowing, okay, you got a cash flow, yep. and uh, you have you got to have reserves. So in case you have a vacancy, or in case you have a minor repair that you have to, you have the money to do it. Yep. All right. Okay, I've seen several questions come up, Joe, about uh, the balloon payment. That kind of freaks people out sometimes. They think they're gonna have to pay. Yeah, this talk about payment that payment somewhere. Um, so. If you're looking at your balloon payment in a bubble as the single only property you're ever going to buy, then you probably need to have some sort of plan when that balloon payment hits, right? Uh, there, there's two ways that you can go about it is you could end up just selling the property, right? For whatever equity that you built up during the time you're owning it. You could list it on the MLS. You could list on the MLS. Or you give the property back to the seller. It's a non-recourse loan. Now we don't want to do that, but understand that's kind of the worst thing that could happen. Like there's no real estate jail, right? It's not gonna impact your credit score. And technically, even if the seller doesn't see it, you're actually doing the seller a favor. They're gonna make more money because they're gonna be able to resell that property again, collect another down payment and, and do whatever they have to do. So just understand that that's the worst case scenario. And no one wants to do that. We don't want to feel like a jerk and we weren't able to follow through and feel like a failure. And we've messed up on this property. We don't want to feel like that, but it's not going to kill you and it's not going to hurt your credit. And then there's no real estate jail that you're going to for it. That's the first thing. Second thing is if you are in real estate investing to continue going and then continue to building a portfolio, the more properties you have, even if every single one of them has a balloon payment, the more options you have. Right. So don't be so concerned with that. I would rather see you focus more on controlling assets. I think it's Joe's, uh, Joe mentions it all the time. Was that a Rockefeller thing that the secret to being wealthy is to um, own, own nothing, nothing and control, control everything. Right. So you want to be able to control. And if you can get into a deal with a, a balloon payment, that's going to allow you to get control. I recommend you do it now. Albeit, I'm not saying get into any deal with a balloon payment. You still have to analyze it. It still has to cash flow. You should still want some equity in it if you can get it, right? And when you have the equity, you have the cash flow, that produces a return. And if you have that property holding for a year or two or three, and it's performing the way that you wanted it to when you, when you initially got into it, right? There's a return there. And if that return is there, that means there's room for other people's money to come in and, and, and put longer term financing in place or pay the balloon payment for you to share the profits. 
There's a lot of different options. I just gave you two or three, but it can go on and on and on. And all I'm saying is the bigger your portfolio, the more options you're going to have. Okay. Well, don't forget too, by the time that balloon comes due, you should have enough equity in there. Totally. It should it be easy on what the to get back. Right. Yeah. You should, you should be easy to get bank financing or get a private lender yeah. to lend you the money and bring the deal to them. So just make sure when your balloon is due, like you have the options. And we teach that a lot. You got to have multiple exit strategies. So when that balloon comes due, you can refinance it with the bank. All right. You can get a private lender. You can list it on the MLS and sell it, make some money from that, even that, even after realtor commissions, get money from the sale of that. Um, and also don't forget too, and I know you, I know you mentioned this, Matt, uh, many times the seller will call you early before the balloon and it says, oh, hey, can, when can we get out of this? Yeah. yeah. And, and then you can negotiate a discount. If you owe them a hundred, you can say, all right, well, I can close you out now if, if we change this to 80. You, you yeah, know, the that, other side of that, and that's a beautiful part. And I, thanks for bringing that up, Joe. I can't believe I forgot that. But every time I take a property owner f with seller financing, it's on my calendar for every six months to check in with them to say, hey, I've been sending you this $300 a month. I don't know if you need or not. I came into some cash. I'm thinking about buying another property or I was just thinking of paying one off. I don't have enough to pay yours off, but since, you know, I thought I'd just offer it to you first. Would you accept such and such amount, right? And have that conversation every six months. And we get about 70% of those accepted before that balloon payment ever comes due. Yeah. That's just another one, right? So, yeah, you could call them, but chances are pretty good that they're going to call you and ask you, hey, what can we end this? Can we do this earlier? Um, good question from Judy here. We are always positive on these webinars. Um, thank you. I would like you both to address hiring virtual assistants um, or assistance and how all that works with telephone solicitation acts, do not call rules, telemarketing acts and statutes and stuff like that. Um, I'll just throw my two cents in here. We're not lawyers. I don't know. So you have to, if you're really concerned about um, do not call lists and anti-marketing spam stuff, you should be, it is a big deal. Um, I don't recommend you call or text people on the do not call list. Um, that's number one. But when number two, if they're not, or if you've already had a relationship with them or, you know, I, I've heard some people argue that it's, it doesn't matter because you're not selling anything and you're not using automated voice, you know, blasting software. Um, and, you know, you're, you're calling them. So kind of depends. That's my answer. What, do you, what would you say, Matt? Yeah, I mean, you're right. You, you hit it on the head when you said the, the gray area there is you're not selling anything. Right. I, I, so that's one part. The second part is I, um, I'm just of the mindset that I'll uh, ask for forgiveness later. And I've been doing this for 11 years and it hasn't, let's see, I guess I'm close to the same as time as a music video. So probably 13 years, I guess, really. Um, never once has it ever come up ever, ever. And I've done a lot of calling, a lot of texting. It's never come up. I get more people like from the postcard saying I'm on the do not mail list, which I didn't even know existed. Yeah, <laughs> but and, you know, uh, even if there is that rule, it's, I don't think it'll ever happen. There's right. But I'm just saying it's, it's never come up. So I just, and, and you understand your own risk tolerance. You understand what, how you want to proceed and do what you want to do. Um, but it has, uh, don't let small little doomsday scenarios stop you from moving forward with, uh, with your financial freedom. Yep. Good. All right. So again, some people I'm seeing here are asking questions about where's the link um, for how do I get the stuff? It's again, creativefinancinglab.com slash 2021. I just put it in the link in the, in the chat, put the link in the chat, creative financing lab slash dot com slash 2021. Um, people are asking, how do I get the mind maps? The video was good. Um, how do I get the videos and the recordings? So that is in there. All right. So going back through the questions, um, Lipsy says the free screening was amazing. So much content like drinking from a fire hose. Um, Shaniqua, how do I get the mind maps? Awesome stuff in there. Again, go to that link I just told you. All right, here's a question um, from Teresa. With option three in lease options, I think, Teresa, what you're talking about is my lease option assignment, a wholesaling lease option or lease option assignment. We don't take into consideration repair costs into the price, right? 
We just give her, we just give the seller the price they want. Yes. So, but you know, I, I, I typically will do the as is price. So if a house is worth fixed up 150, but as is it's worth about 125. Well, I'm not going to do that deal if the seller wants 150 because it needs 25 grand in work. So um, I'll just give the seller a lease option agreement for 125 with the right to assign it to another, somebody else for a fee. Um, and so it's very rare for a seller to say they want 150 when it's needs 25 grand in work and it's only worth 150 fixed up. If it is, you got to you just let them send them an offer anyway, follow up in 30 days, every 30 days and give them some time to cook to kind of come back down to reality. And then you can turn that into a deal. Um, Charles is asking, how do I get the bonus books? Um, they will be, they're, they're PDFs. They will be, they're in the membership site. Nice. There are a lot of questions. Good thing. Uh, good thing that uh, the, if you, if you go ahead and you, and you buy the videos that it's coming with, do we set six additional coaching calls? Yes. Six additional ones. Okay. So Joe's going to do three. I'm going to do three. Yeah. Those are spread out over how long of a period, Joe? I forget over three to six months. Maybe we're doing twice, two a month or one. Oh, I think we're doing one a month. Okay. For, for six months. Right. Cause there's a lot of questions. We obviously are not going to be able to get to them all. And we also have the private Facebook, the private Facebook group as well. That's right. That's right. The, let's move through. Let's try and move through quicker. All right. I got one here from James Jackson. Uh, and I'll take this cause it's lease options. What happens if a lease option contract transaction subsequently has legitimate property owner lien attachments unknown to the property owner. Although the option owner would normally not would, would have cry, recorded priority, this seemingly would adversely impact quiet title and new owner equity when the option is utilized. All right, so this is a question. This is a good question, but it's a what if question. And I always say, guys, you gotta be careful with what I call anticipatory thinking. Um, if, this is, if this has really happened to you, I'd be curious, James, to ask you like, has this really happened to you or is this just a what if? Because you could be stuck here all day asking what if questions and never get anywhere. So be careful with anticipatory thinking, right? But here's the thing, when it comes to a lease option or any kind of deal, you always record your interest with the county, right? You're gonna record your interest and there's different ways to do that. One, a memorandum of option or a memorandum of some kind of um, interest in the property, okay? Number two, I, like to, I recommend a, a power of attorney, a limited power of attorney, if you can get that signed. Number three, um, you can put properties in trust. Sometimes that helps, but I'm not the trust expert. Final thing I'll say is I learned this from Vena Jones Cox up in Ohio. She uses an instrument called, oh, an option to mortgage or something like that. I forget. It's in my course, but um, it's it's a mortgage. Uh, there's a name for it. I'll come, it'll come to me later when it's Matt's turn to answer a question, but some kind of mortgage. Talk to an attorney or a title company, okay? And your option will be recorded more as a, mortgage. That just kind of makes everything a little more solid and in and, and, and line. Having said that, what if the seller goes into bankruptcy? You, you know, that's going to happen sometimes. And in fact, um, that may just be something where, you know, you have to give the sell, you have to give the tenant buyer their money back. Or if it's a regular tenant in the property, you know, at the end of their lease, they have to leave and you just give the house back to the seller. That just happens. So I don't know what else to say to that. Got it. Let's see if we can. I've got a hard out in 23 minutes. I'll Joe. go and continue. Okay. You're done That's just the, the problem with if, if someone, if any of you are getting a little bit discouraged or frustrated that we're not getting through the questions fast enough, it's in the world of real estate, there is so, like, you ask a question and it depends on so much. So I wish we could just give you nice, solid, universal answers that one size fits all. But that's probably why some of the answers are a little long winded because there's a lot of variables in play. Okay, I got um, somebody was complimenting here the nine point seller interview, Matt, that you have. Okay. Which is really, awesome. really good. Sweet. Um, okay. Everything is online in the course, unless you buy the physical stuff. And that's going to be in books and DVDs and stuff. Okay, here we go. Uh, my initial market, my backyard is in the DC metro area. That was a great place to be the last couple of days, right? <laughs> in Washington, DC. What has your hey, experience been? Down that path again. Oh my gosh. All right. What was your experience been with doing deals in this part of the country? Um, here, here's my thing. I would probably not want to 
do any deals in Washington, D.C. area? Because number one, it's so expensive. Uh, it's very competitive, very expensive. So I, you have the entire United States opened up to you in your backyard. That's your real backyard. Now, we often say start in your backyard and then go out from there. But I would recommend, I'm a big fan of the small towns. So I would look at all the small towns in Maryland and Virginia and maybe go after those those markets first. Uh, DC metro area is beautiful. It's a great area, but it's super expensive and very competitive. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, it just depends on what you're buying for. You go into the higher price points because you're right, DC is really expensive. I mean, if you're looking to cash flow or do creative financing, it's going to be tough. The higher the price point, the more tough it's going to be. So I would say you want to kind of stay in it where the median price point is probably 500 or, or K and less. Cool. All right. Do you see a question in here? And again, that, that depends too, but for a rule of thumb. Good, good, good. Let's see. Here's uh, Gregory just came in. Where do I find leads for free leads for real estate to do your program plus to lend money to house flippers? It's in the program. We did all the free lead stuff, right? Yeah. Yep. Does this course go deep like your standalone courses or is it more broad in general? We got pretty detailed. We got very detailed. We did a lot of demonstration right over the, the monitor. Um, as a fellow real estate agent, do you disclose to any of your on-market AKA Redfin deals? Say that again. As a fellow real estate agent, do you have a license, Joe? I didn't know if that yes, you Yes, I do. Okay. Do you disclose to uh, your on-market Redfin deals? All right. So that's a good question. Cause you know, if you're a realtor, how and what you can market to, it gets a little fuzzy kind of to what Matt says. And don't quote me on this. Sometimes you'd rather, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. So what I do is I, cause I send out thousands of letters and postcards a month, right? I'm not going to go through that list every time I do it and see, make sure of whether a property is listed or not. So what I do is I'll put a, a sentence in the bottom of the postcard or the letter that says, if your house is listed with a realtor, please disregard this or give this to them. That's all I do. All right. Now, kind of some MLSs require that you put, you have to put your broker office information on the card and letter. I don't like doing that. I would rather get my wrist slapped if I get in trouble for it, than do it. So, but I do put on there, if your house is listed with an agent, feel free to give this letter to them. Um, Cause I don't care. I, I like working with realtors, right? So I want the realtors to call me on their listing. So I send marketing to everybody, whether it's listed or not, I send them marketing. That's all I'll say to that. Um, okay. Here's a good one, Matt, for you. I'll let you answer this one. Can you give a good rule of thumb when, each creative strategy should be used when you're introducing them to the sellers. Does that make wow. sense? Okay. That's a good question. So it is a good question. And I'm going to put, do a, uh, a shameless promotion here. That's fine. But I just cover this exact topic on my YouTube you know channel. That you can make on my YouTube channel. It's, it runs down through all of the different creative financing strategies and when to use, one, when they're appropriate and when to avoid them. Okay, so I'll put that right there. What's when, the uh, video called on your YouTube channel? Um, might be when to use them, when to avoid them, no. It's called a creative financing, there you go. Thanks, Joe. Here we go. There, creative financing real estate investing, when to and when not, epic profit and cash flow. Say that five times. There we go. I copy and pasted it so no one has to say it. You can, <laughs> see when you're in YouTube, you have to put the keywords in there. Otherwise yeah, no one's okay. ever gonna find it. So sure. that's why sometimes those answers uh, don't make sense or those titles don't make any sense. You're welcome, Wayne. Yeah, so I see it right here. Creative financing, real estate investing, when to and when, and when not. not. And you put that link in the Zoom chat? It's right above the, uh, the title. Okay. Cool. All right. So can you just summarize that real quick, what you said in there? I mean, I went through every single strategy of when to use this one and when to avoid it. All right. This. All right. I mean, I can do it, but. No, no, no. Just watch the video. 
It's free. Yeah. And there's also there's a cost to watch your YouTube. I don't need your email or anything inside that video. And it'll give you like a little checklist <laughs> of each strategy, when to, when to avoid it. Yeah. And I don't, you don't have to opt in for anything. All right. Good. Here's the thing though. When it comes to making offers, um, give the seller options. We talked about this. Give them a cash offer and a seller financing offer and a lease option offer, you know? Um, or sometimes I prefer to give just two options. I give them a cash offer and a seller financing offer. And I do that to position my seller financing offer as a much better deal because my cash offer is way down here ridiculously low. But my seller financing is what I really want, but I'm positioning that cash offer to make this one look better. Um, Dana has got a really good point here. This market looks a lot like 2002 and 2004. She's right. Hi, Dana. But not um, for the same reasons. Yeah. It looks like it but it's not the same thing underneath that's causing it. Yep. Okay, Steve is asking, Matt, what is the minimum equity the seller needs when making seller finance offer? Uh, you can do it with nothing, right? So you can do a subject two and take over the payments and then you can seller finance the difference if there is a difference. And then you can wrap them together, making one all-inclusive mortgage or trust deed. So you actually don't need um, any equity there at all. Just make sure it cash flows. That's the most important. Cash flow is a big deal. Yeah. Yep. Um, what's the difference between seller financing and owner financing? A question from Jeremy. Nothing in my mind. Same thing. One is from the seller. <laughs> one is from the owner. The owner. I'm sorry. I oh, That's the kind of answer I give. I give Mercedes and she slaps me all the time, but I couldn't resist. Yeah. No, they're the same thing. You don't want to mess with Mercedes. I know. She's really cool. That's Matt's wife, in case you're He's the smarter curious. Sure. Okay, here we go. Here's a good question from Tony. My seller wants to do a lease option because the tenant is behind on payments. The tenant will not allow visits. He's always too busy. And now he says he wants to buy it. How do I work this out somehow? Oh, good question. Um, depending on the deal, if there's a lot of equity, then I will go ahead and just tell the seller, listen, let me take care of the tenant. Don't worry about it. Um, but if there's not much equity, I'll tell the seller, listen, as soon as you take care of the tenant and it's vacant, let me know and we can do something. Um, so it, unless you're a realtor, Tony, I don't know if there's much you can do on this because the seller wants to sell it. The tenant buyer may, or the tenant who's in the house may want to buy it. Um, so I don't know if there's much you can do with that unless you're licensed and you can broker the deal. You don't want to broker deals unless you have your license. Um, you want to add anything to that, Matt? No. Let's get the next question. Um, just because I wasn't listening, I was reading all the other questions. That's fine. All right. Um, Sam is asking, are there any situations where you would want to buy using contract for deed instead of subject to? Yes. I would prefer to sell contract for deed and buy with seller financing. So that's my distinction, but it's not a hard line. I will buy via contract for deed if it's a really good deal and I really like the property. Like I don't have a problem giving up that level of ownership. Um, and then if I'm gonna do a contract for deed instead of on top of a subject two, uh, we can do that as long as I give, as long as the note is managed by a third party note servicing company, because I don't wanna be paying the seller and the seller not paying the mortgage. So I wanna make sure that a third party handles those payments. But those, that's, that's the difference. All right, good question here from Peter. When should I use the three option format letter of intent? I get confused from real estate agents and sellers, or uh, the real estate agents and sellers get confused with the letter, letter of intent, three options. Um, perhaps I'm giving them only, perhaps I should be only giving them one offer and then three offers. Do you have suggestions on when and how to present the three option format? Yes. First of all, do not, I, I wouldn't lead with it unless it's a marketing piece you're just sending in the mail. That way I've, I've used it that way. Um, second, I would be very careful on your, guard your expectations with regard to involving real estate agents with that three option letter of intent because they just don't understand it. They're confused and they'll say no. Um, third thing is, and that was th think what you're leading to right at the end was always go for the equity first. 
always speak the seller's language. That's a much easier path yeah. to, a, to a negotiation. The seller only understands price. So just always go for the price first. And, and so you're negotiating the price with the seller. If you're unable to reach an agreement at the price, then it's like, okay, well, Mr. Seller, I might be able to get you your price. The market might be able to allow this to happen, but um, I might not be able to get you it all at once. How much do you need right now? Right? So that's, that's how I always make that transition. I don't like to use the word seller financing, owner financing with, with sellers because they just don't get it. They don't understand it. It's a scary word. But if I say, how much do you need right now? That means we're going to delay how we give you the rest. Um, the, the best way I think to use a three option letter of intent is when you come just to an absolute impasse and they say no. You say, well, you know what? I'm sorry, we're unable to reach an agreement. Doesn't look like the market's gonna allow us to both get what we want. What I can do is leave you with this uh, letter of intent. You'll see it has three options on it. My number is down there at the bottom. So I'm prepared to purchase a property in one of these three ways, uh, but my number's at the bottom. If you want anything, give me a call. Yeah, so I that's totally it. Agree. That just kind of sets the foundation for me to do a really easy follow-up. But that's how I use it. And now my last one would be Josh Miller, uh, one of my rock star clients. He's one of my great stories. I talk about him all the time because he's one of those guys that he was my student. And all of a sudden he started to teach me stuff with the stuff that I taught him. And the one thing that he did was with his three option letter of intent is he went through every single one of his old leads, everyone that ever said no to him. And he sent them all a three option letter of intent in the mail. And that resulted in, and this sounds like a crazy number, and I wouldn't throw this number out here if I was making this up, but it is a crazy number. He did 55 extra deals. This was in 2018. He did 55 extra deals just from that practice alone. Now, we generated a lot of leads, right? He went on a lot of appointments, but it turned into 55, uh, 40% of his whole production that year from doing that one thing. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, one of the things that I did on this last uh, new market challenge that I did is I did, um, I sent, um, what do you call it? I sent offers, cash offers on the actual postcards. Mm. And uh, I'll tell you what, my, we got eight leads out of the, not a huge response rate, um, out of the 1100 that we sent. Um, eight calls. We sent them a cash offer at like 70 cents on the dollar. Uh, the th 1100 that we sent and we had eight that, we, that called us back. Now, some of them are dead, but do you think we might get a deal out of that? Yeah. And so here's my, I want to add to that. Um, I like sending blind offers or three option letter of intents after I've already talked to them. Um, so if they said, no, this is a great way to follow up. What if you sent every 30 days, a three option letter of intent to that seller? Um, that's going to get the attention of that seller. All right. Um, one more question here from Abby, kind of related. When you're offering creative financing to listed properties, what's in it for the agent? What can you offer as an incentive to the agents? For me personally, um, I always talk to the agents as I will get you your full commission. Some of it now and some of it later, but maybe we can work something out, which is better because this happens a lot when the seller tells the agent, listen, if you don't sell my house in the next 30 days, I'm going to have to list it as a rental. And then that agent will only get one month's rent as a commission. But if they bring me the deal, I'll give them one month's rent now and the rest of the rent later on down the road or with payments over time or something like that. So you can get creative with agents. Or if it's a good enough deal and I can get a private investor, I, I'll give the agent all of their commission up front, right? Um, through my private money lender, all right? All right. Um, Somebody's asking about uh, REI Simple. Do I get your workflows and automations? Yes. Oh. And my people, I get this a lot. Um, my workflow automations in REI Simple are very, very similar to Rob's, Rob Swanson's workflow automations in FreedomSoft. Very similar. And, uh, and the cool thing is you can copy them and edit them and make them your own. You can, you know, so every different campaign sometimes will have different automations. It's really easy once you learn how to set it up. Mm -hmm. You have one? I... I have one if you don't. Um, yeah, that is, here's one from Rick just came through. With those 55 extra deals that my student closed, did the student market research all three of those options at least one? Um, do all the market research fill in letter? I'm not sure how he did. I, that's a really good question, Rick. I know he had a, a three or four VAs working for him, so it might have been that. But I wouldn't let that stop you because when I send out the, the – uh, I have a formula like I'll send out via direct mail – 
or I'll have a formula that I'd use when I'm sending it from realtor to realtor. And it's all based off of the fair market value. So if you just fill in one number, you can auto populate the rest of your offers that way. So you can do it either way. Um, I prefer to go that way because when I, if you're going to send a three option letter of intent in the mail, like it's not going to come back in the mail signed with an agreement, right? You're just going to get a phone call and that's all you really want is yeah. to get a phone call. Yeah. And because you sent out a three option letter of intent last week or last month, they call and say, Hey, da, da, da. So, you know what, let me see how the market is. And, and as long as uh, the market hasn't changed a little at all, then I should be able to honor it. But let me see. And, you know, if you could answer a few questions about your property and, and I could uh, get you an offer, do you have time to answer some questions? And now, boom, now you're in the first, you're in the first block of the nine point seller interview. And I'll take them through the whole thing, right? So the three options that I've intent through the mail is just to get your phone ring. It's just another really a marketing piece. It's this is a, a real commitment. good question from Steve here, but we don't have time to answer this because this is what we, we covered this in an entire session in the creative financing lab, which is, I just want to bring this question up because this is why you need this. <laughs> okay. I'll be right back. Joe. I'll be right back. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a minimum equity that you target for seller financing offers? And do you research, research how much equity they have? Don't sellers need to own the property outright for them to be able to do this? Um, so, okay, the first question is, what's the minimum equity target? Matt spends a lot of time talking about this. On some areas, if it cash flows, it doesn't matter how much equity it has. If, they, um, if it, it can cash flow and your goal is to hold the property long-term, what does it matter? Because you're taking over a mortgage subject to that has an interest rate of three or 4%. Um, and it's renting for, you know, it's a nice house. It, you can get two, three, four hundred dollars in cash flow. Um, yeah, not a big deal. The, uh, if, the, the other question though is, does the seller need to own the house free and clear for them to do seller financing? Um, yes and no, not really. Okay. Because you can do what's called a subject to. Now, when we say seller financing, it's kind of a broad term. Um, so sometimes what we do is we'll set it up where we take over the existing mortgage subject to, and then we give the seller a little financing carryback, seller carryback financing. So sometimes what I like to do is when I'm talking to the seller, and I used to do a lot of these back in 08 and 09 and 2010, I would say, hey, listen, what if I could get you the same equity you would get if you sold with a realtor? So would that be fair? Yeah, it'd be great. Okay. So then I broke down the cost. If you were to sell it, they listed for this. You'd have to put this amount of work into it to fix it up. You have this amount of commissions that you have to pay the realtor. You have this closing cost and miscellaneous costs and all that. So at the end of the day, if you list it for a hundred, just using simple round numbers, you're probably only going to walk away with 85,000. Okay. And then let's say they owe 80. So they really, they, they think they have $20,000 in equity, but they don't. They really have $5,000 in true net equity. And I tell the seller, listen, I can get you all $5,000 of your true equity if you're willing to wait for it. If you want some of it now, okay. So I'll give them different options. My options would be, number one, I'll give you all of your equity. And I had different ways to spell this out, but I'll give you 2,500 now for all your equity, or I'll give you $5,000 for your equity in five years. So if you want it now, I'll give you less. If you want it later, I'll give you more. So you kind of negotiate. So it's a mixture of, Subject to a little bit of seller financing carry back on some of their equity, right? Um, that's one way you could do it. So it just kind of depends on the deal. Um, but you can do seller financing even if there is a mortgage on it. Don't think that you have to pay off the mortgage. Sometimes if you can bring in a private investor, you can pay off the small little mortgage with a private investor, right? And depending on how you structure it, you can put the private investor in first position or in second position, right? So you... It just depends on the deal. And we spend a lot of time talking about that in the creative financing lab, which by the way, if you guys, if we'll put the link in here again, creativefinancinglab.com slash 2021, oops, creativefinancinglab slash 2021. And if somebody is watching this on YouTube and Facebook, would you put that link in there? We'd appreciate it. Creativefinancinglab.com slash 2021. All right, we got a lot more questions to answer here. Okay, Matt's going to have to leave in a few minutes. I'm going to stick around yeah. and uh, answer some more questions as well. Go for it, Joe. And then just, just FYI, I just, it's the week after the holidays. So I am back to back on my calls through this whole week. But um, if you participate with the creative financing lab 
and you take advantage of the offer that, that Joe and I have presented to you today on my coaching calls. And the last time we did it, I would spend two, three, four hours with people. And I even put it some additional days on Saturdays just to make sure I got everyone's questions answered. So um, don't let me bowing out right now, have you have under the impression that this is how it's going to go. I'm very, I was very um, free with my time is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, right? you, you definitely are. And yeah. I'm going to stick around for at least another cool. hour. So we're good. Cool. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate you. And all right, Matt. Have a good all look. of you. Hopefully I'll see you guys uh, here shortly on the next coaching calls. Take care. You're coming to St. Louis soon, right? Oh yes. Uh, second, third week of, uh, of it'll, this be, month. it'll be nice and cold. We'll do some golfing. I like it. <laughs> Very good. All right. See you, Take Matt. care, Joe. Bye. Bye everybody. Good. Good guys. Um, I'm going to keep on going here with questions. Matt did tell me earlier in advance that he had to get off. So um, cool. Um, good question here from Marianne. When the balloon payment comes due, how do you fund that? We talked about that a little bit before, but private investors, number one, okay? And number two, go ahead and list, you know, six months before it's due, list the property on the MLS and sell it. Um, offer the seller, uh, you know, ask the seller, negotiate with the seller, a discounted payoff. Hey, if I pay you off an, a year early, you know, would you be interested in that? If you'd like some more money now. Um, so you can negotiate a discount. You can get a private money lender in there to pay that off. Um, or you just give the house back to the seller if you can't pay it off at the end of the balloon. That's why the balloon is there. If you can't pay it off, you can give it back to the seller. Um, okay, a lot of questions about tools from Lipsy. Lipsy has a question here. Who's an agent investor from Miami. Um, they've done some flips, some value buy and hold. Value add, buy and hold. All, all of the deals were bought from wholesalers. Um, I want to find my own deals, preferably for owner financing. My bump in the road are all of the tools. There's REI. You have REI Facts, BlackBook, REI Simple, PropStream. Where do I start? Good question. Um, let me just put in a plug for my CRM because it is the best CRM in the world. I white labeled a version of FreedomSoft. It's called REI Simple. It's amazing. I've seen and been through and used all of the different CRMs. In my opinion, it's the best, REI Simple. Um, and in the, the, I white labeled it because I've customized it and I've added in all my contracts and marketing pieces and stuff in it. And so Rob Swanson at FreedomSoft has just done an amazing job updating it. He's constantly adding new features. And it's the only tool that I've found that it's a phone-based CRM. You know, what I mean by that is like leads come in and you can do all your communications with the seller from inside the lead, which is incredibly valuable. <clears throat> so you can do your marketing and make your offers and handle the leads all the way from, and you can do skip tracing and marketing and texting all from inside of it. And it does your follow-up automated. So I would start with a good CRM. That's what I would start with. Number one, a good CRM like REI Simple. Um, or, you know, there's other good ones out there. Aria Black Book is really good also. Aria Black Book is fantastic. Um, so you can start with that. Most good CRMs out there come with a way to get lists. So first start with getting lists from your CRM. Like Aria Simple, you can get good lists from them. But if you want more detailed lists, like more granular, try something like PropStreamJoe.com. PropStreamJoe.com because, you know, then you can dive into like properties with liens and tax defaults and, high equity, low equity, free and clear um, owners that own property here, high equity that live outside of that county, things like that. I've been using PropStream to buy vacant land leads to send marketing to. It's all right. Um, some people are asking, hey, Joe, if we are already a student of your simple lease options stuff, do we get a discount? I'm sorry we don't because Matt and I are doing this together. And we're already discounting it so much. I mean, it's crazy. Um, Two ninety-seven for digital only. Three ninety-seven for physical and digital. So we're not. I'm not giving any discounts. Um, okay, Laura. Lease options are not possible in Texas. So how can this be handled in Texas? All right. First of all, um, Laura, you can do lease option assignments in Texas. Lease option assignments. My good friend John Jackson's been doing them for 12, 15 years in Texas. Lease option assignments, but you can't do sandwich lease options. So you need can do land contracts, contract for deeds, owner financing. Um, Texas is a great market. 
just use different paperwork, call it something different, call it subject to contract for deed, land contracts, whatever you want. Um, you can use the contracts that we have in Creative Financing Lab to do those deals in Texas. Um, so that's what I would say. If a tenant buyer does not pay, then who is responsible to pay? Crystal, if you're doing a sandwich lease option where you're staying in the middle, if the tenant buyer doesn't pay, then you pay. Um, the same with if you were doing, if you're buying with owner financing and putting a tenant in there and renting it out, you would pay the rent. I mean, you'd pay the financing payments if the tenant didn't pay. So just make sure, number one, you have good reserves so you can cover those things. Number two, start the eviction process the day the rent is late. Once the tenant is late, send them a letter. Preliminary eviction notice. If you don't pay the rent in the next seven days, I'm going to contact my attorney and we're going to start the eviction process. Right? You give them seven days. If they don't pay it, you contact the attorney. The attorney sends a letter. You've got seven days, 14 days. If we don't pay, we're going to start the eviction process. You know, that letter comes from the law offices of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. So then it just, so my whole point is you got to be proactive. That tenant buyer or that tenant has to learn that the rent is the first thing that they have to pay every month. I don't care about the um, rent eviction. I know we're going to get 500 questions about that. Um, you can still evict tenants if they break the lease. Okay. <clears throat> um, you can't evict them if they lose their job because of the pandemic, the COVID stuff, but all that stuff is expiring soon anyway. Even if it gets extended, there's assistance and all that. Plus most of the homes that we teach you to be in, um, the tenants are not going to be in that kind of a situation. So I could spend a half hour talking about that, but the idea is, especially when this is all over, you have to be very, very proactive with your um, managing your tenants and all of that. And you need to have reserves. So if it happens, you have the, the money to, to, to follow. And if you're super concerned about it, you can put in your contract with the seller. If the tenant doesn't pay rent, I'm not going to pay the payment. There's nothing wrong with putting that in the contract. In fact, one of the things that you can negotiate with the seller is if they're stuck on, if they want this price and you want this price, you can tell them, all right, let's do this. I'll give you your price or we'll meet in the middle if you allow me to not make a payment if the tenant doesn't make a payment. If the house is vacant, I will only make one month's payment until it gets rented again. And so if it takes me three months to fix it up and get another new tenant in there, I'll pay the next payment, but you will seller, seller will make the next two or three payments. So you can negotiate that with the seller. That's a great thing about these terms deals. You can negotiate price or terms. I'll get you the price you want if you give me the terms that I want, like maybe no payments for six months, no payments for a year. Uh, you know, payments of $200 a month for the first six months, $500 a month for the next six months, and then $1,000 a month for the next, um, you know, I had, a, I had a student in Alabama do a lease option with the seller. And um, it was a handyman special, needed a lot of work and said, I will do this at your price. You let me keep 100% of the rent for the first two years. And then the next three years, um, we'll split the rent 50-50. So she's getting $900 a month cash flow for the first two years. And then after that, she's getting $450 a month cash flow for the next three years. And the tenant buyer she put into the house is fixing it all up themselves. So win-win. I mean, the seller's getting the price that he wants and the student, um, Marty, is getting the, the terms that she wants on the front end to the rent. Does that make sense? Okay, good question from Jeff. What are the pros or cons of lease options as opposed to keeping the property as a rental? Um, Jeff, if you want to be out of the property in a couple, three years, four or five years, then you should do a sandwich lease option, put a tenant buyer in it, okay? But if you're looking for long-term buy and hold wealth, long-term wealth building strategies, put regular tenants in there. Here's advantage, the advantage of doing that. You know, if the market rents, let's say are 1500, you should advertise it for 1400 a month, which means then you're going to get a ton of applications. Then if you're just renting it for the long haul, you want to take the tenant that has the best credit history, the best employment, the best job history, the best the income, the best debt to income ratio, the best credit score, the least amount of problems, because then you can be more picky. The rent is super competitive. You're going to get a lot of applications. And when you get somebody with a credit, with a better credit profile, they're just going to be a much better tenant for the most part. Does that make sense? 
Um, you're gonna and, and so listen to that interview I did with Michael Jake on my podcast, Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. Let me talk a lot about that. What do you think about using crowdfunding to attract investors when the balloon? Okay. Um, what do you think about crowdfunding? Mariana, it's a good question. I've never done that. I don't think Matt has either. Um, you know, if we need money for deals, we just use private lenders. And there's a whole really good module in there about using private money. Um, so you should look into that. I don't think you need crowdfunding. I really don't. You know, if you, if you just had one private investor with a couple hundred to hundred grand, you know, they'll probably have more and that might be all that you need for your deals. Peter is asking a question. Have I ever been a student of a particular guru? And my answer is no, I've never, I've never bought. I might've bought something from that guy. I'm like seven bucks or something. Um, but I've never had, I've never bought his high end program. When doing lease options from Carmen, how are you looking for your price to offer the buyer, the end buyer? When I am advertising my property to sell, I always want to be competitive. So if it's worth 150 today and I'm selling it to a tenant buyer in two, in two years, I might set the price at 155, 160, right? Because like I want them to have some incentive when they get ready to buy the house in two years where there's some equity in there and they can buy it. And they want to buy it because there's some equity, right? So I don't try to, I don't bump it up way high. I, I keep it very close to what it's worth today. And so you just figure that in when you're making your offer to the seller. You know, you don't figure that you're going to sell this property for 170 in three years. You figure you're going to sell this property for 155 in two or three years. And that's going to lower than the price you can negotiate with the seller and all that. Uh, good question from Rob, I think. My target deals are subject twos and sell via owner financing. If you want to buy subject to and sell via owner financing, what would you recommend for target marketing to my group, to this group of pretty houses based on the marketing you taught in the training? Um, good question, Rob. Um, you're selling on a wrap. You buy a house subject to and you sell it on a wrap where you wrap the new mortgage around the original mortgage. Um, a lot of my friends in Texas do that. Um, so how do I find those? By you want to look for motivation. So there's certain things that will tell you if there's a motivation or not, right? Pre foreclosure list, a liens list of the, if there's liens on the property, um, unpaid utility bills, been on the market over 60, 90 days. Um, sometimes what I used to do, I don't do this anymore, but I used to go through lists providers and find properties that had that were bought in the last three to five years with little equity with FHA or VA financing. Because then I knew people moved on average of every three to five years. Now that's longer. That's like every, that's like seven to 10 years, I think is the average when people move. But I knew at the time, like they would be moving soon. They don't have much equity and I would send them letters and, and, and they were targeted into the specific zip codes that I wanted. Um, that's what I might recommend. You know, I, that's why I like direct mail because direct mail, you can target specific neighborhoods and type of owners that you that are looking for. Um, it costs you a little bit more money, but it's, it's well worth it. Um, Wes is asking when you are looking at properties on Redfin for comps and the property is 2000 square feet with an unfinished finished basement. When I'm calculating repairs, do I figure in the basement for my repair estimates. If you're going to finish the basement, yes, you should. And REI Simple is a really good rehab estimator where it'll say what is the pre-rehab square footage and what is the post-rehab square footage. And you can have 2,000 for pre, 2,700 square feet for post-rehab, after rehab, and it'll give you a really good rehab estimate for finishing the basement. Um, Titus is asking, is there a proper, is there a software that can help me look what all my buyers are paying for side by side and see who is paying the most? Hold on one second here. Oh, nice. Might be too nice. Really? I would say no vest, but ask mom. She said, uh, ask dad. Okay. I'd say no vest. 
<laughs> fine go ahead all right so, that was my awesome son he's uh he's applying for a new job at bmw and uh, so he's wearing he was asking me what i thought of what he was wearing and he was wearing a nice dress shirt with a vest and i don't know he it's a long story he's uh, he's a really good kid um okay so is there a software to see you know what buyers are paying for um titus what i recommend is get a list in excel and uh, either find somebody who's good at excel or learn how to do it yourself and i would just play with it in excel now I, there's things in excel or spreadsheet worlds called pivot tables and uh, what i would do is i would go in and um i'd find somebody on fiverr and and say uh, and do a search for the word spreadsheet or pivot tables like pivot like you pivot pivot tables and there's pretty ninja stuff you can do with pivot tables so you can look at by zip code and by buyer what they're paying on average and you know look at all the properties through that so that's what i would say question from jose how do you approach reverse mortgage leads you know, Jose, I just have to be honest. I don't know enough about reverse mortgages to give you any advice on that. I, I've tried to do deals before or make offers on reverse mortgages and it just got so confusing. I I said, sorry, I can't help you. And I passed on the deal. I'm sure there is a good way to do it. Um, I don't know enough about it. Okay. And I remember on this one particular deal I was working, um, there was a bunch of family. This was for an elderly couple. There was a bunch of family involved and it was almost becoming like a probate deal. And I just said, I, you know, I'm sorry, I can't help you. All right. So I don't know. Um, ooh, good question from Gregory. What would your first offer be if you came, if you came across a vacant or rundown house where they owe more than it's worth other than a short sale? If I found a house that was owed more than it's worth, I don't know. I would, I would probably find out somebody in my market who does short sales. I know you don't want short sales, but I would find somebody in the market that does short sales and I would bring the deal to them. And I would say, Hey, I want to buy this house, but I don't want to pay. I'll only pay this. If you can negotiate this deal for me, I will buy it and pay you $5,000. And I would find somebody that could do the short sale negotiating for me. And I, I wouldn't do any kind of creative short sales where they're behind on payments, pre foreclosures, you've got to make a cash offer on those. So that's the only creative thing I would do. When do we choose 70% of the current as is market value as the offer price versus using 85% for the same option offer price? All right, Darwin, a general rule of thumb, when I'm making a cash offer, it's 70% of ARV minus repairs minus wholesale fee. When I'm doing a lease option, it's 85% of ARV minus repairs, or sometimes I call it 85% of the as is value. So I kind of do 70% for cash, 85% for lease options. Does that make sense? And when it comes to seller financing, it's just about cash flow. So it's just about terms. Question from Crystal. Does the deposit made by the tenant buyer have to be paid by me in a sandwich lease option at the end? Does it get credited to them? So when a tenant buyer in a lease option makes an option deposit, it gets credited back to them as when they buy the house. And it usually re reduces the price of the home. Depending on the lender that they're working with, they can get it to apply to their down payment, but you can't guarantee that. Um, usually it's just a credit on paper. You have to show the bank a copy of the check that they made two years ago for $10,000. Most of the time that can get applied towards their down payment if they're working with a good banker, mortgage broker. Um, but I don't promise that. I don't guarantee it. It just really depends on several things that are outside of my control. Okay. But it's just, it's just a credit on the HUD statement. It's a credit on, just like if you were to pay $5,000 earnest money deposit, you know, you write that in a check, it goes to an escrow company, they hold on to it. You don't have to write another $5,000 check when you get ready to buy the house in 30 days, right? You do, they just they just look at the proof that you've made that payment 30 days ago. That's the same way for a lease option deposit. Okay, good question from Derica here. I'm so overwhelmed. I mean, so much info. Um, how do I begin with all of this? I'm a newbie with no experience. I have very little capital. I'm coachable. 
but I'm not knowledgeable. Um, okay, very long question from Derica. And this is common, guys, when you're first getting started and you, 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 know, you get a course like Creative Financing Lab, you're like, what do I do with it? I'm so overwhelmed. Um, I, you know, here's what I recommend. If you're getting started, you want to focus on the real simple stuff like marketing, talking to sellers and making offers. Okay. Forget about everything else. Forget about raising private money. Forget on closing the deals and finding the buyers. You know, all you need, you just need to worry about getting the marketing out there so you can start talking to sellers and making offers. This really, this business comes down to those three things. Marketing, we're not in the real estate investing business, we're in the marketing business. So understand, learn marketing to get the phone to ring or outbound marketing to ring their phone. Learn how to talk to sellers. We have some of the best training, I think, ever out there in Creative Financing Lab, especially for Matt, because Matt's so good at it, on how to talk to sellers. So learn how to talk to sellers, learn sales skills, super important. Also, one of the things we talked about in the class, there's a really good YouTube video that I did with my friend Claude Diamond on, we did a cold call. It was a live cold call um, where we talked to a seller and just listen to that call. It's about five minutes long. And Claude asked a good 20 something questions. And it was such a good call. You got to learn how to talk to sellers. You got to learn how to talk to sellers. So marketing, get them, getting leads, sales, focus on sales and how to talk to sellers. And then third, focus on how to make offers. Then it's, 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 this is just focusing on one thing at a time. Don't think about the what ifs. Think about the what next. What next? So when you get a seller that says yes, what do you do then? Well, number one, you can get a coach or if you can't afford a coach or even if you have one, Go find another investor in your market that has already done these kinds of deals and bring the deal to them and say, hey, will you partner with me on this? So, and I've done this a lot. When I'm doing deals in another market, I'll find somebody else who's already has the buyers, already has the title companies, that has all the connections and the lawyers and paperwork. And I'll say, hey, I got a deal in your market, Houston. And uh, will you partner with me on this? Okay. And I'll split the deal 50-50 with them. So what I recommend is learn the basics of marketing, talking to sellers and making offers. And don't worry about anything else. Just focus on those basic things. I wrote a book called Being Brilliant at the Basics. Um, you've got to be really good at the basics. And that's simple, okay? Then find somebody else that you can bring the deal to them in your market that already, if it's a cash deal, a lease option deal, find other investors that are already doing what you want to do and say, hey, can we partner on this? Split the deal 50-50, okay? Uh, Julianne, awesome, has a property under contract, I think. And she's saying, is there a way for me to email the details to you or discuss it? Um, so if you have a deal you want us to look at, Julianne, I just don't have the time on this call, but if you're in one of the future coaching calls that Matt and I do, at the very beginning of the call, submit the details of that deal and we can look at it. Um, Sometimes I partner with students on deals, but they have to be a student who has my course and they have to get it under contract first. All right. Alan, the answer to your question is yes. And if you have any, if, if by the way, guys, if I don't, you, some of you are asking really good questions about um, what you get with Creative Financing Lab. Um, and, and if I'm not answering those questions, please send an email to support at joelmccall.com. Support at joelmccall.com. And we will, my team will answer that question for you. Does that make sense? Because I still have a lot more questions here. In fact, I might pull up my chair and sit down in a minute. Would you put South Dakota into your search fields on Zillow and see what shows up? Would you still recommend me to try and find for sale or for rent deals in South Dakota versus another state? Good question, Darwin. And I will do that for you because I think that's important. Okay. So this is a question from Darwin. And I'm going to share my screen because I think this will be really good for all of y'all. 
to see. All right, so this is, again, creativefinancinglab.com slash 2021. You get all this good stuff. And this is going to be gone Sunday night. All right, let's look at, let's look at Zillow. All right. And um, I'm going to pull up, hold on here, South. Dakota. Did I spell South Dakota right? Mm, it's a nice, beautiful, small state. Let's look at for sale. And let's look at, I'm going to do sold. And then I just want to do it for sale by owner. And I want houses. Let me turn off land. And I want no lot size limitations. Zero. There's zero for sale by owner. Is that right? For sale by owner, houses. Let's make sure I don't have any other filters in here. All right, let's look at rentals. There's the, Maybe this is right. Maybe someone else can search for me, but there's no FISBOs. Let's look at rentals. Why is it doing this? 60 rental properties, 60 houses for rent. Rapid City and Sioux Falls. What do I do? This is so, it's such a good question. But let's look real, let's go to for sale by owner. There's none, right? So what do you do? Let's say there's a hundred and you've already marketed to all of them. What do you do? See this button right here? Oh, let me go back closer a little bit. I accidentally zoomed out. There's South Dakota, no FISBOs. I'm going to click right here, remove boundary. There's still none. Something tells me something's wrong with my search here. Oh, that's why. That's a problem. Okay, okay, I get it here. Zillow just made this change here. <laughs> All right, I was on agent listings. I'm, I'm doing, even though I'm doing a search, this you got to be aware of this. Even though I'm going by owner right here, I hope you can see this. You still have to go and you click search. You still have to, you have to go here. All right, so there's a hundred, there's zero agent listings and 127 other listings. All right, and so, I mean, I can market to all of them in one day. I need more than that. What do I do? Okay, click remove boundary. Now there's 833. All right, so you market to all of them. And that takes you maybe two weeks to go through. Well, here's a little minus button on the map. Click on that minus button, zoom out. Now you have 6,008. So one day, one week, just go to SD, South Dakota. You have 127. All right, next day, next week, go to ND, North Dakota. They got 131. Cool. Next week, go to MN. Now you've got 265. The next week, go to IA, Iowa. Now you have 665. The next week, go to NE, I think is Nebraska. I always get it mixed up. Or NA. Yeah, Nebraska, NA. You got 273. And then... Well, now what do you do? Go back to SD, South Dakota. And you just keep on rotating through those two or three or four or five states, All right? And then also don't forget the for rents. I love for rents and I like the nicer houses, right? So let's do a thousand a month plus three plus bedrooms, houses only. Oh my gosh, there's only 37. What do I do? Oh, remove boundary. No, there's 528. Let me zoom out. Now there's 5,376. Three plus bedrooms, rents over a thousand a month, houses only. Okay. And again, you can do the same thing. Maybe one week go after Iowa. There's 212. The next week go after Minnesota. 545. So these are the links. This is the criteria that you're going to give that scraping company I recommend in the course. And they're going to go through and scrape all of this every week and give you that data. 
and uh, you can send them marketing. You're going to go and click on one of these properties, Grand Rapids, Minnesota. It's listed by the property owner. You're going to send a text right now to this owner, Lynn, and say, hey, I saw this nice house on Clover Lane in Grand Rapids. You wouldn't have any interest in maybe selling it, would you? And this is where, you know, you can do this all in REI Simple. And you can also skip trace the owner, find out who the owner is and send them a postcard or a letter with a few clicks. So that's what you do. Start in your backyard in South Dakota and then zoom out. But if you're insistent on adamant on staying in South Dakota, then you're going to need to look at direct mail. You're going to need to look at, you know, Google pay-per-click or Facebook marketing, things like that. All right. Why the baseball caps? Thank you, Dana. <laughs> it's because we're both almost bald. I'm Matt's more bald than I am. Nobody's complaining except my assistant, Dana, about my baseball caps. But she did that so long ago, she's probably not even on here anymore. Okay, so we got half another hour, another half hour to go. And I'm going to, I've been kind of going from the top to bottom. I'm going to going now from the bottom up. And um, if, and we're not going to get through all the questions. It's crazy here. But um, if you uh, if you want more of your questions answered, then um, get the thing. Get the Creative Financing Lab because we're going to do six more of these calls. And Matt, he's insane. He, literally, I'm not kidding. I've seen him do this a couple of times. He'll be on the call for three or four hours making sure all the questions are answered. Okay, Marianne's asking about a class. I've said a couple of times that I would do a land investing class. Um, I'm still thinking about it. Um, the problem is this, there's already so many other good courses out there on land investing. Um, like Jack Bosch has got a great course on land investing, Mark Podolsky, Seth Williams from um, RE, RE Tipster. Um, so I'm not planning on creating a course to compete with theirs. But I will say this, um, I might come out with a course on just how to buy land. Okay. This session is recorded. It's in YouTube right now. So you can go into YouTube and watch this. For someone that is totally new to all these concepts and terms, will your 10 training modules be what they need to become proficient? Yes. Good question, RZ. We don't hold anything back in these modules. Okay. And if we do get you, we'll give you your money back. They're, they're very thorough. It's not like we sell you on something else that you have to get to get the complete picture. Thank you, Nick, for the kind words. Do I blame my baldness on real estate investing? Come on, Jeremy. No, it's funny. I heard somebody else say the other day, I used to have a forehead. Now I have a 10 head. The dung dung. I heard a joke the other day. You, you want a dad joke? What's the difference between a camera and a sock? What's the difference between a camera and a sock? With a camera, you take photos. With a sock, you put in five toes. <laughs> Ooh, cringe worthy. You know, I heard, I heard that from a guy on Instagram who's hilarious. Kevin on stage. I'm too afraid to look at the comments. I'm not even going to look. What webcam am I using? It looks so crisp. It's called a Sony a6400 with a lens on it. That's like this long. I don't understand. I had a friend help me set it up. What do you do if the bank calls a loan subject to due on sale? What do you do if the bank calls due a subject to deal? Well, Steve, number one, it's, unlikely for it to happen if you're making your payments on time. But if they do, well, then you need to be in a position that you can go ahead and get some financing on the house, number one, or be in a position where you can get some private money on the house, at least temporarily. Or number three, go ahead and give it back to the bank. Let them take it back. I mean, um, not much you can do about it. But again, it's rare for banks to do that. You, if they do, though, you just have to be prepared um, for it. Okay. Hold on one second here. 
my son texted me, my other son, about playing Xbox. All right, I just texted him back. Muhammad is asking, how is this course different than your other courses? Um, this course is different because you got Matt teaching half of it. And Matt's teaching really good content on owner financing subject to getting private money. I teach mainly lease options and cash deals. He's teaching a lot of the other creative deals. And Matt just has a very different way of um, presenting how to tell, how to sell the concepts to sellers and how to talk to sellers and all of that. When a seller agrees to the deal and you get a tenant buyer, how do you do the payment structure so that when the buyer pays rent and eventually the balloon, then the seller gets their money and you also get your profit from the deal? Do we get an escrow company to escrow and distribute the money? Um, Philip, well, that's a good question, but you're, you're going to stay involved throughout the whole process anyway. So you... When you, when you stay involved in the deal, you're going to make sure that you get paid. Does that make sense? And yes, you always use a title company and an escrow company to handle all the money. It's a good question. So once you make an offer, how do you pay for the deal? Does the buyer pay for it or do I? So if it's a cash deal, I'm either paying it with hard money lending, private money, or my own money or I'm assigning and selling my contract to the end buyer. If it's a owner finance, that's for a cash deal. If it's an owner financing or lease option deal, I'm not using any of my own money to buy it. I'm borrowing the money, either by taking over the mortgage, doing a lease option, um, or you know, getting a new seller financing on the property. Good, good question from Susan. Do you have any good suggestions on how to use marketing um, if you work a full-time job? Susan does in-home daycare, so she's not able to answer the phone at any moment throughout the day. What do you do? Great question, Susan. So all of my marketing, especially my direct mail, I put on there, please call our 24-hour recorded hotline, 24-hour recorded voicemail hotline if you'd like more information. So that phone number, when you say that, call our 24-hour recorded voicemail hotline, number one, you'll get more calls because of that. They know if they call, nobody's going to answer the phone. So you'll get more calls, number one. And number two, them, uh, when they leave the voicemail, you can listen to it, pre-screen them out, and then call them back when it's convenient for you. The problem is going to be a lot of people just don't answer their phones right now these days if it's coming from an unrecognized number. If you use REI Simple to call the sellers back, they will see that it's they're, you're calling them back from the same number that they called you on. And you can also text them, okay? So if Mary calls you and leaves a voicemail, you can text her back, hey, Mary, I got your voicemail. I'll call you back in a little bit. And then you can text Mary again, hey, I'm going to call you in a few minutes. Then you call Mary. And if you leave a voicemail, you leave a voicemail. And then you text her again, hey, I just called you and left you a voicemail. Call me back when you, when, you, when you can talk about your house. Um, so that's why I like using REI Simple for your marketing because you can get virtual phone numbers from REI Simple and you can communicate with sellers like that. What amount should I budget for postage when I'm starting? So if you're going to be doing direct mail, Laura, I'd recommend you start with at least a minimum budget of $500 a month for your direct mail. I get a bare minimum and you should be committed to do it for at least three to six months. Find a very targeted niche list and mail them really consistently every one to two months, mail them again and again and again. And if you have that small of a budget, I'd really recommend if you can, Laura, to answer the phones when they call. Even if you put on their 24 hour recorded voicemail, okay? I have a friend who did this and he swears by it. He still answers the phone. And he's told me no one ever complained. They were just surprised to get somebody to answer the call. And you call back everybody, even if they don't leave a voicemail. If they hang up, you still call them back anyway. When you're buying deals subject to or seller financing, where does the money come from? So if you have to make the seller, a, you know, if you're making a $5,000 down payment, where does the money come from? 
Good question, Sonny. And we talked about that in the course. You need private money and it's not that hard to get. Um, you get private money. And basically, if I have a deal where I'm buying it subject to and there's $300 a month cash flow and there's not much equity and I need $10,000 from a private investor to either get the loan current or as some a down payment or some kind of cash incentive offer to the seller, I don't have $10,000. I'm going to get it from a private investor. Now, you may be wondering, well, the private investor, they're going to be like, I'm, I, don't have much, I don't have much protection in this deal because there's a big first position mortgage and I'm going to be in second position. Why? What's in it for me? Really, really simple. And I learned this from Matt. You tell that private investor, listen, you put it in the note. If I default and I don't pay you your interest payments, okay, you can just take over this deal for me. Now, if you default and you don't make your $100 a month payment back to the seller, which you get from the rent, okay, that, that investor who lent you $10,000 on this deal will just take over the deal and they'll be getting $200 a month on their $10,000 investment. $200 a month, it's $2,400 a year. That is a 24% return on their money. Is that right? Yeah, which is really, really good. So you just got to make sure the deal is good enough. If the deal is good enough, finding the money is easy. You got to tell yourself that in the head. You got to get that in here. If you have a good deal, finding the money is easy. Okay, good question from Tyrone. I'm interested in buying an eight to 12 unit apartment building. What about the tenants not paying because of COVID? I can't evict them until the pandemic is over. Um, so Tyrone, you got to figure that out because every you'll find from the rent rolls whether the current tenants are paying. If they haven't been paying, you know, in the last six to 12 months, you know, or whatever, they're probably not going to be paying. But if they have been paying the last few months, they're probably going to continue paying. They've got a good job. Um, so you just need to find that out from the owner of the property that's selling it. Um, and don't, don't forget, like if they break the lease for any other reason, except non-payment because of COVID job losses, pandemic related stuff, you can still evict them. If they um, are, are causing too much noise or they get into, they start dealing drugs or they have too many people living in the house. If they break any of the other aspects of the lease, you can still evict them. Um, and you know, from who knows what's going to happen. This rent or this eviction moratorium cannot last forever. But if you're still really concerned about it, then don't buy the apartment yet. Wait until it, this eviction moratorium is done. Okay, good question from Thomas. How do you exit a sandwich lease option? Do you need transactional funding to close A to B and the B to C? Or do you just do a simple assignment or do you sell or your equitable interest at closing? Okay, Thomas, good question. And the answer is there's a lot of different ways you can do it. It just depends. You need to make sure you find a good real estate investor friendly title company or attorney that can help you with it. So what I would do is I would find a title company. I'd bring the deal to them and I say, listen, this is what I want to do. I need your help. I'll pay you for your time and your counsel and your advice and all of that. But I have a deal here where I'm buying it on a lease option and I'm selling it on a lease option. What's the best way to do this? Bring the deal to the title company that you know works with investors. They understand, you know, you want to find the title companies that are helping other people do wholesale deals and subject twos and things like that and say, what do you recommend? So there's a couple of things. Number one, you could take it over subject to six months in advance. Okay. Um, this is a, um, um, what do you call it? Because sometimes they're seasoning. You have to be seasoned on the title for six months. So do a subject to six months prior and then just sell it to them. Um, or you can record your, if you, um, you could do an assignment, get paid as an assignment at the end. You could record a, um, um, a lien on the property for, if your profit's going to be 30 grand, you can record a mortgage on the property for 30 grand. And then you just put the buyer and the seller and they close together. You get paid afterwards. Um, I've had a title company before do this where they call it a revocation of option. They put on the HUD a revocation of option. So the option was recorded in the county. I got paid to re remove the option, which cleared the title for them to close together. Um, or you may need to get private money um, into the deal 
so that you buy it and then turn around and sell it. It just really depends. And don't just ask one title company, ask several different ones. What do you recommend? How do we do it? Okay, guys, just 15 more minutes. I'm losing my voice. So I'm going to go through some more here. Do I still do rent credits with your lease options that when you sell it to a tenant buyer? Um, uh, yes and no. Um, sometimes I don't, if I do them, I only do a small hundred bucks, 200 bucks a month. And I, I call them seller concessions um, that reduce the price of the home or go towards their closing costs. So they don't go towards their down payments. Some people say that causes problems with Dodd-Frank and maybe it does. Um, so if, it, if you're concerned about that, just call it something else. Call it seller concessions, go to closing costs. Do you get to pocket the option deposit money on a lease option deal? Jeremy asks. Yes, you do. Now, I don't recommend that you spend all that money. Um, if you get a $5,000 option deposit from the tenant buyer on a deal, I recommend you save as much of that as possible, at least half of it, put it in the bank. So if there is something that happens in the future, you've got some money to cover any vacancies or expenses or things like that. Do you have to give the option deposit money back? If they buy the house, I do, but it's, yeah, I'm not, it's not like I have to pull out $5,000 out of my wallet and give the cash back to them. It's a credit on paper. Just like if you were to put earnest money down on a house, a thousand bucks made out to the title company, and then 30 days later, you actually close. All you need to do is show them the proof that you made that thousand dollars 30 days earlier, and then they will credit that as part of your down payment when you buy the house. Well, lease options, the same thing, except it's two years later. You don't have to keep that money in a bank account and then bring out the cash to close the deal. Uh, Laura is asking, you mentioned Redfin to find houses. Um, is Zillow or Truly an option? Or is Redfin better? Um, I like Redfin, but I also use Zillow all the time. Trulia is owned by Zillow. I don't know. I don't use Zillow or Trulia anymore. Um, what I have found, it depends on the market you're in, but I have found that Redfin tends to have better information than Zillow in terms of more information, number one. And they and Redfin has a better relationship with the local MLSs around the country. So I get better, more accurate sold data and MLS data from Redfin than I typically do with Zillow, but you just need to test it in your market and see which is better. Roger asks, doing owner financing 100% virtually without ever seeing the property or meeting the seller in person, what changes? Uh, Roger, so if you're doing deals virtually, you need to have somebody on the ground to go look at the property for you. And that's when I recommend working with local realtors. Um, so I start with local realtors to help me with that. That's the best way to do it. Deborah, I don't understand your question about QuickBooks, Elite, Pro Advisor, Excel. I'm not sure I understand. Shane's got a question. If it's in January and you sign a two-year lease with the seller, but in February you find a buyer that signs a two-year lease from you with the option to buy it, how does this work? since your lease will run out a month before the tenant buyer's lease is up. Well, Shane, I wouldn't sign a two-year lease with the tenant buyer. I'd only sign a one-year lease option or one and a half-year lease option with that tenant buyer. But also, I probably would never do a two-year lease option agreement with the seller in the first place because it doesn't give me enough time to find a tenant buyer to buy it after that. So um, I would only do a two-year lease option with the seller if there's a lot of good equity in it. And so <clears throat> in two years, I can either get a mortgage because there's enough equity in it, um, or I know that I can price it low enough that I can, it'd be easy to sell it to somebody else within that two years. Price or terms. So again, if it's the sellers, if that two year thing is more important to them, if the terms are more important to them, then the price goes down. If the price is more important to them, then the terms go down, right? Price or terms, just think of it that way. So if they're stuck on their two years, well, I'll give them the two years if they give me the price that I want. Learn to understand the differences between price and terms. That's a great thing about these creative financing deals. You can negotiate. If you're just making cash, all you can negotiate is price. 
if you do creative financing, owner financing, lease options and stuff, you can negotiate the rent, the down payment, the term, the number of years, the monthly payment, the interest rates, all of that stuff. You can negotiate four or five different things. Okay, Julia, I believe, is asking a good question here. When a seller accepts my subject to offer, they keep the mortgage in their name. Yes, that's true. Is it going to be hard for him to open another mortgage with a bank if after selling the house, he still has a mortgage in his name? And how is he going to buy the new one? Because having two mortgages makes it more difficult. All right. So good question. Um, when I'm talking to a seller about doing a lease option or subject to, they need to know, you need to tell them, if you're planning on buying another house, you need to talk to a mortgage broker about your situation. They can get another mortgage. People do it all the time. They, but they, they're going to have to, the, the mortgage bank, the broker is going to have to look at their debt to income ratio. And they're going to have to also look at, um, you know, cause they're, they're going to count the income that's coming in, but usually banks only count or allow like 75% of the rent towards their income. So they still have to make sure they have enough to cover. They just need to be aware. Sometimes banks require six months reserves, three months reserves. Um, so it just depends on that seller and their situation. But again, this happens all the time. Sellers do it all the time. They buy a house, they move and rent their current house because they want to upgrade to a bigger house. So it's not a big deal. It's not hard. It's not that hard for people to get a second mortgage. But you need to tell the seller, you need to have this discussion with a mortgage broker because it may make it more difficult for you to buy another house if that's what you plan on doing. Oh, thank you for the kind words about my stupid dad joke. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that's funny. Can you sell with seller financing when there are existing tenants in the property? Yes. So you would sell it to an investor Calvin. So if you get a property that has tenants in it, let's say it's a duplex and uh, there's two tenants in there that are paying rent and they have another year and a half left on their leases. Well, you can buy it with seller financing from the seller. Okay. And so basically you just have to make sure it cash flows. And if you wanted to, you could sell that package deal to another investor to come in and take your place. Um, Manny's asking what I consider ever investing out of a country, like in places like Venezuela. And I would probably say, no, I don't know enough about Venezuela. I know I'm sure houses are cheap in there, but like, I, I don't know anything about Venezuela. I would probably Manny find somebody who has done it before and partner with them on some deals. <clears throat> Steve is asking, can you wait to start your seller financing pay payments until you find a tenant? Definitely, most definitely, 100%, Steve. You should try to negotiate that with the seller. You could tell the seller, listen, I can get you that price or I can do five years instead of 10, but let's do it this way. Or I'll do that if um, we'll write it in the agreement that I won't start paying rent or payments to you until I find a tenant buyer or or tenant or I, I'll start making my payments in six months, okay? Uh, Rick is asking, are you still doing REI simple coaching calls? Um, I'm trying to figure that out, Rick. I don't know. I really don't know. Yes, we're recording everything, Jal J Jalina. Do you know how to access the How to Raise Private Money book that Matt wrote? Chris, if you have questions about Matt's book on how to raise private money, um, I would send him an email. If you go to his website, Epic Real Estate, I think epicrealestate.com, there's a contact us button on there. Um, just send his him an email.
Uh, Samuel, which states do you like best for doing sandwich lease options? I'm in Texas and I want to start doing this strategy virtually. Um, well, first of all, Samuel, I would say like you can do deals in Texas. Like you can't do sandwich lease options, but you can do owner financing subject twos, land contracts in Texas. So I always recommend starting in your own backyard if you can. Um, or if you really want to do lease options and do lease option assignments, you know, but like in many ways, it is easier to do them in your own backyard. So I would recommend trying to do the other kind of creative deals in Texas. Good. So a lot of you guys are answering questions in here for us. That's awesome. Um, Calvin, does ARV matter when you're doing creative financing? Does the after repair value matter when you're doing creative financing? Of course it does, right? You want to know what it's worth, but it kind of doesn't because if you have enough time, like let's say a house is worth $100,000 today. The ARV is $100,000 today. But the seller wants, let's say something ridiculous, $200,000. What? Well, maybe I'll give the seller $200,000 for that house if I have a balloon in 30 years, in 15 years, and I keep 100% of the rent for the first 10 years. Yeah, I'll give them a $200,000, but I'm getting now on the $100,000 house, I'm getting $900 a month in rent, cash flow, you know? So I can virtually almost give the seller any price they want if the terms are favorable. So I keep the rent, 100% of the rent, for the first five years. And I don't pay any rent if it ever goes vacant, or I only pay one month's rent if it goes vacant. Yeah. So the ARV does matter. Does that make sense? Thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate that, man. Jeremy Green. Chris is asking, have you found a replacement for Trulia's heat maps? Um, no, but in my course, Chris, in my lease options course, I do talk about other things you can do. And one of them being, um, 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 I'm sorry, I just got distracted. What was I saying? Um, oh, I remember. So from list source, and I, I don't have the time to show this to you, but you can go to list source and download in the last six months, all of the retail transactions, like, in your county, how many, where were most of the houses bought and sold by zip code? And you can get from that where the hot activity is. That kind of replaces heat maps. I don't know why Trulia got rid of that. Option deposits are non-refundable, right? But they're, well, they're refundable if they buy the house. I'll credit them back that money if they buy the house. What do you pay local realtors to check out properties for you? It's all negotiable, Steve. If I'm having a, a realtor help me sell the house or buy it, you know, um, I'll pay them their normal commissions. I just figure it in my offer. Does that make sense? So um, if I buy a property for 50 cents on the dollar, I'm going to try to sell it for $70,000. I'm going to buy it for $50,000. It's worth a hundred. I'm going to sell it for $75,000. I'm going to pay that realtor a normal realtor commission, you know, 3%. If it's too cheap, then I'll pay them, you know, $3,000 or something, $5,000. Uh, do you recommend adding home warranties for your tenant buyers? Yeah, if you can. It's only, you know, 500 bucks a year or something. The recordings for this will be available tomorrow. I mean, as soon as Zoom, Zoom is recording this. And also this, this recording for this call is in YouTube and it's going to be available right as soon as I'm done. Because you can just go to my YouTube channel, Joe McCall, and you can find the recording for this call. Ah, good question from Brian. Um, you mentioned on the last, one of the last modules that when you're talking about land that you're getting a 10% response rate, but only a half of 1% rate on houses. So why would we spend the time and money on direct marketing to houses? 
Okay, so land investing is a completely different business than house investing. Land investing, you're buying rural vacant lots in the middle of nowhere for 20 cents on the dollar and you're selling them for 50, 60 cents on the dollar. Houses are much different um, and there's advantages and disadvantages to both. So the reason I'm doing land is because my boys who are 17 and 15 can help me with that side of the business. And I have a good friend from church that once I get a deal under contract, he sells it and then we we split the profit. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but land, I get so much better response rate with my direct mail for land because there's so much little comp, there's so much less competition doing land. Um, and that's why I can buy them for 20 cents on the dollar. And you've got to send out a lot of mail to find the sellers that would be willing to sell it to you that cheap. But with houses, again, okay, that's another good thing. With houses, they're easier to sell because there's more of a demand for houses. Land is harder to sell because there's not as much demand for land. So when I get a property under contract from a house, I can sell it a lot faster because there's a much bigger pool of buyers. Somebody's asking, what is ACH? ACH, is some other people are answering, asking and answering questions about getting paid. ACH is like a, is a wire through the bank. I forget what it's what it stands for, but it's like when your bank sends money to someone else's bank through ACH. It's like a different version of a wire. Is there special insurance or liability coverage that is needed for subject to and or seller financing? Um, Jason, I don't think so, but um, Matt would be a better person to answer that question. And I would talk to your insurance company about it. Um, I'm not an insurance expert. Um, you just have to make sure that the insurance, the homeowner's insurance that is on the house has, this is really important. You have to have the seller as additional insured and you need to have the bank as a mortgagee. So if you get new insurance, you have to be on that, you have to be named on that insurance. The seller has to be named on that insurance or your trust or whatever. And the bank has to be labeled named as mortgagee on that. So, and you shouldn't have two different insurance policies. I know some guy that keep the existing mortgage policy that keeps the existing insurance in place and they just add themselves as, as additional insured. If you can do that, I guess that's fine. Um, but there are insurance companies that will do, and do insurance specifically for your owner financing subject twos. And uh, you just have to make sure that the seller is still protected, you're protected, and the bank is protected most of all. Yes, Joshua, California is tough. That's why I like virtual investing. Kirk, when it comes to sandwich lease options, if you have a lawyer or a title company that can help you with close those deals on the A to B at the beginning, then yeah, you could, you should use a lawyer or a title company to help you those deals. You don't have to though. You are going to need a title company or an attorney when you actually buy the house in one or two years or whatever. Um, Peter, you have all of the updates. Yes, you have them all. And if you have any questions on that, Peter, please send an email to support at joemccall.com. Peter Hundley. So yes, yeah, send an email to support at joemccall.com if you have any questions on that. Uh, Sharon's got a good question. Do you recommend doing a lease option on a personal residence? The owner is interested in selling, but wants to pay off a $155,000 loan on the property. And that's worth about 450,000. So this is where you're going to need um, probably a private investor, Sharon. So if you could find it, if there's that much equity, it depends on how much equity is in the deal, but um, and it depends on the cash flow and all of that stuff. Like we teach in the course, but um, it, it just depends. And I'm running out of time. Oh, ACH stands for Automatic Clearing House. Uh, do I know what time of day and of the week that the coaching calls will be? 
Um, I do. Let me go look that up right now. Um, so our first coach, because we have six coaching calls through, if you sign up for this thing, um, and here are the dates and the times are three to 4 PM central time, January 20, February 17, March 17, April 21, May 19, June 16th. And those I believe are on Wednesdays. So they're Wednesdays, three to four central. Wednesdays, three to four central, starting in January, uh, like the third Wednesday of every month, three to four central, four to five Eastern, one to two Pacific. Now, again, they're, they're scheduled for an hour, but we always go long to answer all of the questions. We have six of them scheduled. Cool, guys. Wow, a lot of questions. I got through at least 75, 85% of them. And if I did not answer any of your questions, guys, or if you have something, you know, about like how to access stump then, or I bought this before, how does the difference and how do I get this and that, please, please, please send an email to support at joemccall.com, support at joemccall.com. Okay. I appreciate you all. And, uh, May 2021, yes, Susan, may 2021 be your most profitable year ever in this business. Again, guys, go to um, creativefinancinglab.com forward slash 2021. I'm going to put this link again in the Zoom chat, creativefinancinglab.com slash 2021 to get lifetime access to all the recordings of the session that we did. And um, we're taking that down Sunday night. Okay. Real quick question here from Deborah because I haven't answered it. The prepay, the pre-made Excel spreadsheets are not usable unless trained on them or you create your own. Please discuss this issue versus using a program or accounting software. By the way, all of the software is moving to the cloud, subscription-based. Heads up, accounting program is very important to start out right. Don't do catch up. Oh, you're right, Deborah. Uh, the spreadsheets that we give you in the course. Those are totally 100% editable. You can edit those. So they're all Google Drive, Google spreadsheets, okay? And so when you look at them with that link, we give you their view only. You need to go to file and make a copy or file download as a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet. And then you can edit them and play with them. Yes, and everything is moving to the cloud. Okay, good guys. I got to go. I got to make like a tree and leave. Awesome, guys. We'll see you later.